Hello, everyone. Welcome to MEGA's monthly webinar series. Today's topic is advanced end-to-end -end testing. In this session, we'll be discussing why the industry is shifting away from discrete testing of protection functions towards a more comprehensive end-to-end -end testing technique. My name is Yerto. I'm the Marketing Communications Engineer for MEGA North America, and I'll be acting as the moderator for today's presentation. I will be supporting you on any technical issues or questions for our presenter during the session. On the right side of the screen, you will see a control panel that looks similar to this one. You can submit questions at any time during the presentation by typing in the box highlighted in red, and I will read the questions out during the Q&A segment. You will receive a copy of the presentation afterwards and a link to the recorded session if you want to watch it again or share it with your colleagues. Remember, you can ask questions at any time during the presentation, and I will interject them as we have time. Our presenter today is Abel Gonzalez, MEGA's Applications Engineer. Abel is based out of our MEGA office in Toronto, Canada. Thank you for joining us, Abel. Uh, OK, let's go. Um, well, all right. Uh, thanks, Sierra, for the presentation. Uh, we are going to be talking today about end-to-end um, -end testing. And, uh, well, why end-to-end -end testing and what is it all about? Uh, let's uh, talk about the following diagram that we have here. It's a line differential relay diagram. We have a line, we have a couple of relays, uh, one on each end of the line, uh, which have to act together to protect the line in a, okay, in a differential uh, scheme. For that, they need to talk to each other. And for that, they need to uh, see the magnitudes on both ends of the line in order to determine whether the fault is inside of the line or outside of the, you know, protection zone. Uh, now, the only way to ensure that you are testing such a scheme is to uh, have signals applied to both relays at the same time in order to simulate either a fault inside the protection zone of both relays or a fault outside of the protection zone of uh, and such relays and, you know, determine whether the relays are operating properly or not. Uh, in, at some point, someone might think, okay, I will apply a signal to the, what I call here, the local relay and uh, see if it picks up. Then I will apply a signal on the other end to the remote relay and see if it picks up and then I'm happy. But uh, there are so many uh, issues that could happen with the communication between the relays and uh, with the interpretation of the signals that is made from and, and at both ends um, for the same uh, fault that is applied on the line that, uh, of course, the, the only way to ensure the proper uh, testing of such a scheme is to apply signals at the same time uh, in the on the relays and of course evaluate whether both those relays uh, acted properly or not. So this is a definition that I you know came up with about what is end-to-end -end testing. You will find as many definitions as people you know approach in the field, but uh, everybody uh, you know agrees in the fact that end-to-end -end testing is a way to evaluate the entire protection scheme. Uh, by simulating the effects of faults on uh, both ends of the line, uh, which have to be played simultaneously. And everybody also agrees that in order to do end-to-end -end testing properly, the ability to synchronize uh, the uh, application uh, of injection or injection of the signals on both ends of the lines is uh, of the utmost importance. Uh, now, why do you do end-to-end -end testing? Well, um, we, we already talked about it, but it's the only way to perform the simultaneous verification of the operation of all the elements of a protection system. There is no other way to verify the actual operation. Well, barring a fault happening on the on the system, an actual fault happening on the system when the system is in operation, and uh, okay, if that happens and we haven't properly tested the system beforehand, then we are, okay, fingers crossed, let's see what the, if the system operates. It's the only way available right now to engineers to verify the operation of the protection system as a whole. Uh, what do you test? Well, from the theme that we saw before, uh, it is clear that when you're talking about end-to-end -end testing, 
what you are testing is any protection scheme that includes remote communication uh, between relays. This is an example. You have a line, you have a relay in uh, side A, a relay in side B. They are talking using some sort of uh, communications protocol. Uh, relay number, uh, I mean, relay A is telling, is communicating to relay B whether he thinks that he should trip or not. Relay B is relaying that same communication to relay A if both determine that they have to trip. Okay, then they'll they'll uh, they'll trip together. Uh, what type of protections are tested using end-to-end -end, uh, testing? Well, line differentials. Any communication-based uh, distance protection, uh, transfer trip schemes like uh, permissive over reach transfer trip, permissive on the reach transfer trip, etc. So some sort of phase comparison schemes, some automation systems that uh, work in um, either transmission lines, even in distribution uh, places, where you have remote communications between relays that have to, you know. Uh, shift the load or switch uh, from one uh, feeder to, to the other, those uh, are also um, schemes that are prone to be tested using end-to-end -end testing. Again, um, if we see the line differential relay scheme that we see here, uh, we see that this one only has two relays, one on each end. This is a single uh, and simple, I would say, application of end-to-end uh, -end testing where you only have two ends. Uh, since most applications are like this and most applications of end-to-end -end testing are like this, we tend to think uh, of end-to-end -end testing in two dimensions. We tend to think in only two relays uh, talking to each other and uh, we tend to then uh, think of end-to-end -end testing as, okay, we're just uh, synchronizing two uh, test sets and uh, doing what's uh, appropriate to test such a scheme. But sometimes reality is that uh, the system is not that simple. That's why you, 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 uh, you cannot define end-to-end -end testing in terms of just two systems or synchronizing just two systems. Sometimes you need two, three, or more uh, systems operating simultaneously. And when I say systems, I'm talking about uh, test sets or even test systems. Uh, in order to, you know, uh, verify the proper operation of the protection schemes. Now, when do you do end-to-end -end testing? Well, um, most of the times when you're doing commissioning, also when you're doing maintenance. Okay, I mean, in, in commissioning, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer. When you're putting something into service, you have to test it all the way. You have to uh, be sure that it's, you know, working properly, that it's no problem. Otherwise, you don't just, you don't just put, put it into service. However, when you're doing maintenance, end-to-end uh, -end testing is becoming more and more uh, popular in order to verify that whatever happened during commissioning is okay and that whatever changes happened in the system haven't affected the ability of the protection scheme to, you know, properly protect the, the lines or whatever. When you're doing troubleshooting, let's say you have a trip on a relay in a line or you don't have a trip in a relay in a line, and uh, you want to know whether the relay uh, tripped correctly or whether uh, why didn't the relay um, operate. Uh, in those cases, you also do end-to-end uh, -end testing. Uh, when you're doing regression testing, uh, well, that's uh, something for someone who is not, you know, maybe in the utility, someone who is, uh, I don't know, building or manufacturing uh, relays and wants to verify that his relays operate properly in this or that protection scheme. Well, and they'll do it. Any other cases, you know, I'm open to suggestions. Uh, now, the uh, diagram that you see here is what you will uh, end up with in 90% of the cases when you're doing end-to-end -end testing. Uh, in a previous presentation by uh, Megger, by Stan Thompson uh, a few months ago, he talked about the uh, signals that are used to uh, you guarantee the synchronicity of the test sets, you know, during end-to-end -end testing. Now, um, here you see that you have, you know, in both ends of the line, and each end of the line you have the same things. You need to have a relay test set, you need to have 
some uh, form of uh, time synchronization and you need to have of course the relay that is under test or the, the device that is under test which could be a line differential relay, a distance relay, any kind of uh, relay that's going to you know be participating on the scheme and of course in addition to this you need your test cases, you need the people uh, keep in mind that when you're doing end-to-end -end testing it's not the uh, typical testing that you do in uh, in a relay where you know it's the tester with the relay himself everybody else doing something else in the substation nobody is uh, minding whatever he's doing no in this case you need to have active communication with the other side of the line or whatever you're you're testing and you also need to have whoever developed the test cases that you're using you need to have that guy on call in case something you know, comes up with the, but again, uh, if you are either new to end-to-end -end testing or even if you are a system engineer, you've done it many times, this is what you will uh, see in most of the cases when you're doing end-to-end -end testing. In some cases, the GPS receiver is integrated in the test set. In other cases, the GPS receiver is external to the test set. In other cases, you don't have to bring the GPS receiver with you because uh, the substation itself uh, runs, you know, a synchronization signal that's uh, good enough so you can use it on both ends. But you have no way of not having a timing signal uh, that is good for uh, the synchronization of both uh, test sets. If you can have a timing signal that is good for both test sets and at the same time it's the same timing timing signal that is being used to synchronize to guarantee the timing the time signal of the relay that's even better because then you can actually uh, you know see that what you're the tests that you're doing and the, that you have uh, events in both relays that happen when you're doing your testing and you have a way of matching uh, the operation of both relays using the timestamps of those uh, event files. Uh, now, this is just a list of the equipment required uh, to do end-to-end -end testing. Of course, uh, this is according to according to Mega, right? Uh, two relay test sets. We, of course, are going to say Smart 3C, Smart 36, Smart 410, whichever uh, test set. However, as you know, this could be any uh, relay test set, two synchronous time sources. We measure, you know, we provide the MGTR. We'll talk about, later, about it later. Uh, in this case, well, we have the line differential relay. It could be any uh, relay that participates in the, in the scheme. Optical fiber. Well, this is the, uh, I would say, the best case scenario. Uh, it doesn't have to be optical fiber. It can be any kind of communication. Uh, uh, medium that you have in that guarantees the proper communication between the relays on both uh, sides of the of the line. Two computers, now this is uh, unavoidable today, everybody that is into testing needs to use a computer uh, to see what you will end up with, you know, the test cases, you need to record everything that's happening, you need to talk to the relays to either read the configuration or uh, change it and whatever. Um, my take in all this is this last line here, carefully prepare the test cases beforehand, don't improvise and uh, understand fully the system that you're going to test before you go into the substation to do your testing. Um, if not, you're going to end up wasting and losing a lot of time. Uh, this is the typical test connections uh, the, between the, the MGTR2 with the Smart 36. As you see here, we have a computer. The computer is used to connect to control the Smart 36. You can replace the Smart 36 with any test set that you, use your, that you have available or that is, uh, you know, of your preference. Uh, but the concept is the same. You, need a, you usually need a computer to talk to the test set, uh, a computer to talk to the relay, and a computer to configure your timing, your timing reference. You will somehow uh, connect your timing reference to your uh, test set in order to, you know, begin the test in both ends of the line at the same time. Uh, in general, when you're doing end-to-end -end testing, you need to 
create test cases for each of the ends. Uh, why do I say create test cases for each of the ends? Well, that's uh, uh, simple. You cannot go with the same test case for one end and the same test case for the other because even for the same fault, the same fault is seen on both ends differently. Even when you have the fault at exactly 50% of the line and uh, everything is uh, beautiful and nice, which is only maybe 0.01% of the cases, uh, the actual signals are seen differently from both ends of the, of the line, from the relays on both ends of the line. So you have to create test cases for each of the ends. Uh, include enough pre-fault cycles. This is something that uh, sometimes affects and people don't understand why, especially with uh, microprocessor relays. Um, I guess I'll talk about it a little bit later when, uh, when you see the diagram, the, the, I'm sorry, the oscillographies that I have to show. And also simulate faults in different places uh, along the line. Um, when I say include enough pre-fault cycles, I'm saying that don't do something like this. Don't begin your test and maybe one cycle later uh, go with the fault. Why? Well, the reason for this is that microprocessors relays need some time to load the filters that are used, you know, to uh, interpret the analog signal and convert that analog signal into a discrete form and then to convert them into the quantities that the relays use to, to make their, their decisions. That's why I recommend that whenever you can, include enough pre-fault cycles in your, uh, in your testing. Five cycles is usually more than enough to uh, have all the uh, filters in the relays filled, you know, enough information for the relay to know that it is in a stable state, and then uh, go to the faulty state. Now, simulate faults in different places Sorry, along the line. Uh, Abel. I have a quick yeah? question. Um, sure. So why do we synchronize our test sets with a complicated satellite system instead of just using the electrical system, which is already synchronized? Uh, how would you go about synchronizing using the electrical system? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't. I don't have uh, you know feedback here. Okay, what you when, I'm, when we are saying synchronize, we are saying that the test should begin at the same time on both ends of the line. We have a test set here and another test set here. Okay, now this test set needs to begin the test at the same time at the test set on the other end of the line. The distance between both can be 500 meters, 2 kilometers, or 200 kilometers. Okay? Now, uh, the only way to guarantee that the test begins at the same time on both ends of the line is to have a common time source, okay? And with that common time source, I can tell both uh, test sets to begin testing at the same time or to begin applying or injecting the signals that uh, I designed as the signals that uh, the relays on both ends of the lines should see for a particular fault, okay? And the only way I have to guarantee that both relays test sets are going to begin the test at the same time, which is going to be as close to a simulation as I can get to a real case fault, Okay, because when you have a real case fault, that fault will propagate to one end of the line and to the other end of the line at the speed of light, you know, and uh, it will reach one end of the line, I don't know, uh, a few microseconds, the other end of the line, a few microseconds later, okay, but I have to account for that in my simulations. Now, the only way I have to guarantee that there is an actual uh, measurable moment to begin the uh, the test is to have a common time source. Now, when you're talking about synchronization using the power system, when this power system talks about synchronization, uh, what it says is that the frequency of the system is the same uh, in all places of the system. 
but it doesn't mean that the power system has a common time source or anything of the kind that I can use to actually know when to begin the test at one end of the line or to begin the test at the other end of the line. This is what I'm saying. What I'm, this is what I mean when I talk about uh, synchronization. I don't know if that's enough as an answer or if I should talk a little bit more. Okay, here. Yeah, I think we I think we can move on. That's probably good. Okay, okay thank you. Right. No, I just wanted to know if I uh, was satisfied or not. Okay, um, we can. If not, we can you know always go and uh, have a, a longer discussion, a longer you know conversation about this uh, a little bit later. Now, uh, where was I? Okay, now create. No, uh, simulate faults in different places along the lines. Okay, for the same reason that I said that uh, even when you have a fault at 50% of the line, uh, you need to uh, um, actually create signals for relay A and relay B, and you know because relay B is going to see a fault here differently than the relay A. Well, you need to make sure that you are protecting prop the line properly and that relay B and relay A are acting, you know, together. Um, in a, in a manner that allows for the protection of the line for different types of faults. I say here 10%, but you can simulate the fault as close as you want to relay A, a fault as close as you want to relay B. Um, usually, I recommend you know 10%, 30%, 50% uh, of the line, 60%, 90%, which is you know in this case would be the opposite as uh, 10%. And of course, faults outside of the protection zone. To see, you know, what happens when um, relay B has to maybe act because it is falls into his, I don't know, zone three or four or whatever, but relay A doesn't have to, or maybe it has to because it has a. But the point is, you you have to be creative with the types of tests that you prepare, and don't just fall into. Okay, let's do a fault at the 50% of the line. That's fine, and uh, let's uh, let's move on. Um, now, the main approaches to end-to-end -end testing um, are using what we call a state playback, and the other one is using a DFR playback. Okay, um, the state playback. I'm uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, state playback. What you do? is you determine what are the voltages and the currents uh, in both ends of the line for three different states. In one state, you will call it, um, I don't know, the pre-fault state. And you will mean by pre-fault a state in which you have uh, steady state conditions. You don't have a fault. You have something you know going on in the system that uh, could go on forever and nobody has to care about that. Okay? Now, the faulty state would be the moment when a fault hits the system, and then the post fault is what happens after uh, such fault, you know, was cleared by the um, by the protection system. Okay? Now, if we uh, go into, you know, going with the philosophy that we talked about before about you know, using external and internal faults and, and whatnot, uh, we can say that here, you know, we have a pre-fault of, uh, you know, 3 amps, a fault 12 amps, and a post-fault of 3 amps. Since it is an external fault, external fault is something happening here, outside of the protection uh, zones of uh, these two relays, which are acting in a 87L or uh, line differential relay scheme. Uh, since that is the case, well, we would be expecting these two relays not to operate and somebody else uh, to clean the fault for them, okay? Uh, and in this case, what you do is you put 3 amps in the pre-fault state, then 12 amps during the fault. You have that fault last for a few milliseconds, as many milliseconds as you believe uh, the fault should last. Uh, until the whatever uh, protection system takes care of that uh, has as the clearance time, and then 
the post fault, which is the return to you know normal conditions for for the system. Um, now, how do you do it? Well, you use a state simulation tool that many uh, relay test sets have available. Of course, I'm going to talk about the uh, RTMS of the relay test management software uh, from Megger, which has a, uh, a state simulation tool that can simulate up to 15 different states. But this one, we only need uh, four states. Uh, since we are doing end-to-end -end testing, we need to uh, make sure that this pre-fault state begins when we want it to. Okay, so for that we synchronize the system. We uh, ask the system to uh, wait for the IRIC B signal, and during that time, the system, the the uh, test set will be applying nothing. Uh, it will just be there in idle state, waiting for uh, the IRIC B. And in this case, I programmed it to start the test at uh, 13:45:00, which means that at one o'clock, at 1:45 uh, p.m., the uh, next state. Uh, will begin. This state number two, uh, remember that we had uh, three um, amps on the pre-fault, okay, state number two, we will have three amps, this will be a pre-fault. Now, I program here a timeout of 500 milliseconds, that's uh, 30 cycles, which in my opinion is more than enough to, um, you know, as, as pre-fault. Uh, in, in this uh, table here, I have 5,000 milliseconds, that's equally good. I prefer to use shorter times, you know, it makes my life easier. Uh, and since, you know, like I said, 30 cycles is, in my opinion, more than enough for this kind of test load. Let's go with it. Uh, state number three would be the fault. I will just wait for 48 uh, milliseconds, which is uh, roughly equivalent to, or roughly, I think it's actually exact. Three, no, it would be 50, so a little bit more than uh, um, than the 48 milliseconds that we said before. But uh, the point is, I'm going to wait for this time. Then I'm going to go into state number four, which is going to last the same thing, 500 milliseconds. Uh, this is what we, why we call it the states playback, because we have three definite states. In one, we have the pre-fault uh, uh, values, then we have the fault values, and then we have the post-fault values, okay? In this case, since we are expecting the relays to do nothing and we consider any trip during this condition a fault, then we have uh, a couple of options here. We could have programmed one of the inputs in the test set to abort the test if we needed it, uh, or we could just, you know, uh, play the test and go to the relays event files and uh, see what uh, happened there. Um, we could, uh, uh, same uh, following the philosophy that we talked about before, first an external fault, then an internal fault, uh, simulate an internal fault at 50% of the line, and for that we just, you know, create the appropriate uh, uh, states in the Previous fault, notice that uh, for the remote relay, we said that the current in the faulty state was going to be 180 degrees apart, okay? Uh, which means current flowing uh, behind the, the relay, to say it somehow. In this case, since it is an internal fault, and this relay is looking uh, to the left, I mean relay number, relay B is looking to the left. Uh, in the faulty state, that relay will have uh, the current in phase with the current of the local relay. Not in phase, actually 180 degrees apart, but since this one is looking uh, on uh, the opposite way, well, it would be zero. My point is, just uh, keep in mind that in order to create a fault, all you need to do in this case is to reverse the angle. Okay? Now, how do you do that? Well, you do it the same way. You create the same states that uh, we created for the first case. Uh, we do the same. We create a fault and uh, I mean a, a, a pre-test uh, status or state in which we will be waiting. The relay, the test set, will be waiting for the IRIC signal. In state number two, will be the pre-fault state. Then on state number three, we will have. 
on state number three, we will have the fault. Since we have the fault here, um, we have to make a couple of changes uh, from the state number three that we had before. In this case, we are expecting the relay to trip. Since we are expecting the relay to trip, we are going to go on and program binary input number two in the test set to, uh, you know, listen to that uh, output uh, from the relay. And we're going to say that once it trips, it goes into the next state, which should be my post fault state of three amps, or I could say uh, zero amps, depends on how do I, you know, want to play the, uh, in this case, I should have programmed zero amps, not three. Anyway. Uh, something that is the post fault state that you consider that is a good uh, condition operation. Since there was a trip in the breaker and there's nothing else, it should have been in zero. I'm sorry about that. Um, now, what do you need to you know consider in this case? You need to uh, configure your timers. Uh, in this condition, uh, this timer will begin in state number three, which would be the, the, the moment when the fault is applied to the system, and the stop condition of the timer would be post number two, which is the binary input that I'm using at the relay. Remember, I was using binary input number two. Uh, the binary input that I'm using at the relay to you know, account for the tripping of the, not on the relay, the relay test set uh, to account for the tripping of the, of the relay. Uh, after that, all you need is you know, get your results, and uh, of course, get the uh, um, test report. As, a, uh, uh, as an aside, a comment, for everybody else, uh, testing is about ensuring the reliability of the system. For the guy who's doing the testing, testing is about that, but also about the test report. So for him, it is very important to actually have the test report. And if he can have it uh, automatic, automated, it's a lot better. Um, again. End-to-end -end testing. This is a uh, picture that I want you guys, you know, to go home. If I, if I want you to go home with something, it's with the picture that uh, what is end-to-end -end testing and how is end-to-end -end testing performed today. Okay. Uh, now we can also use a contrade uh, playback utility, which um, allows us to do actually. The same thing that we did with the state's uh, playback, but there are many advantages to using uh, country. Um, for those who don't know what country is, country is an IEEE standard. It stands for Common Transient Data Exchange. Um, it's a standard that allows for you know the representation, a common representation of oscillography uh, coming from any kind of uh, oscillographic recorder in the system. And since it is a standard, it allows people to uh, see in standard tools that some of some of them are free in the in the in the internet. You can find them, or some are built into the uh, configuration tools uh, used to configure uh, relays. Uh, and the other thing that it allows is not just to see, but to be played back using uh, modern uh, relay test sets. Uh, since the contract is standard, it also allows uh, to have hardware independence in terms of testing. Uh, as long as your relay test set has the ability to play back those files, then you can be, uh, then you can use any uh, relay test set in order to play back those files and, you know, either uh, play them because there was a fault in the system, the fault got recorded in a in a relay or in some some sort of uh, recorder. And then you can use it to play it back in the relay and see if it operated properly, if it didn't operate properly, why did it happen? Or uh, most, uh, if not all, uh, simulation tools used today for to simulate power systems have the ability to generate contrade files, which is what makes it so uh, attractive. Because on the other hand, in the, com the contrade files, 
we can um, since it stores the actual oscillography of whatever happens or is going to happen or is proposed to happen in the system, it can include the actual behavior of the power system, not just the fact that you have a, state, a steady state and another steady state, which we had with the states playback, and then another steady state, the pre-fault fault and uh, then post-fault. In this case, we can actually include things like uh, exponential decay in uh, when a fault uh, comes up, uh, harmonic uh, distortion. You can even simulate uh, CT saturation and uh, and stuff like that. That's why I, that's why I uh, prefer to use whenever I have it, whenever I have the possibility to use uh, contrast. Uh, um, again, one of the problems that you find when you're using contrast is that sometimes you get the fault. Uh, oscillography or the fault, the, 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 the event of the fault, and there are not enough pre fault cycles stored in that oscillography. The reason for that is well, sometimes people do it to save uh, memory, uh, or in other times you do it in order to get as much information you can from the fault and not so much about the, about the pre fault. Which, in my opinion, is a is a mistake. If, you know, the faults don't happen alone. Uh, but the thing is that, or in isolation, the thing is that it is very easy in a com trade file to manipulate it in order to include uh, more uh, pre fault cycles. You can do it using Excel. You can do it in a Notepad. You can do it in many many different ways. Sometimes it's as easy as just copying a block of uh, of data and changing the timestamps in a very standard manner. Um, you can get a com trade from a relay, like I'm doing here. Then you can play back the relay. If you see, and we are talking about the same oscillography and uh, represented using different tools. Since the com trade is a standard, the, all the oscillographies are represented in, the, uh, in, 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 in all the different tools. The representation of the oscillography is the same. Uh, here I'm using uh, GE's, uh, the UR uh, um, Enervista configura configuration tool. They have a, a very good uh, contract tool. Here I'm using one from another uh, another relay manufacturer. Here I'm using the DFR uh, waveform viewer from ABTS, which is another tool that uh, Mager has. Uh, that is used to test using our our test equipment. Uh, with this tool, you can uh, get the com trade file and play it back in the. I'm not going to show the particulars of that because that I would say is more akin to those who want to you know go deep or delve into the use of uh, ABTS uh, for the purposes of end-to-end -end testing. What you need to know is that you have the ability to get a com trade, then Play it back either manually or synchronously using another uh, tool that comes in the same, that is uh, built into the same uh, software uh, from Megger. And this essentially allows you to do uh, the same that we did uh, with the states playback. We can play back the, the fault into the uh, relays at both ends of the line, or as, as many ends of the lines as I have, at the same time. Um, right now, I think I kind of short in terms of presentation, but I did it a little bit faster. Well, let me talk about what Mager has in terms of equipment. Uh, to do this test, Mager has a very, very nice uh, uh, line of uh, relay test sets. Uh, now, why is it um, you know uh, good for the end-to-end -end testing that we are talking about now? Because we have a built-in IRIC B decoder in uh, binary input number one, which can be used with either an external GPS uh, device or to decode the IRIC B signal that uh, is running in many uh, substations. So it's uh, I would say a very Good tool in terms of the equipment itself. I'm not going to go and uh, you know praise the 
uh, beauties of the equipment and whatnot. And we also have, as a complement for that, we have a GPS timing reference, which is what uh, most people who use the Smart 36 to do end-to-end -end testing and end up using, because they can get from this uh, timing reference, they can get the RFB signal uh, directly into the uh, SMRT, and they can do the, the test that way. Uh, in terms of end-to-end -end testing, let me go back to, because I want to mention something. In terms of end-to-end -end testing, you don't always need, I'm, I'm focusing myself in the, in the presentation on all the time I'm talking about uh, using the GPS and then using the Eric B signal. That's not the only thing that you can do using a GPS receiver. Uh, GPS receivers also have a pulse output uh, possibility, which uh, will give you a pulse whenever a particular time is reached, which means that you can begin your test when that uh, particular pulse is given by the GPS uh, uh, receiver, okay? So that's another way of beginning the, the test because some uh, test sets do not have the ability to decode the RIGB uh, signal uh, natively, so they need something else to give them that pulse in order to begin the, the test. You can, with our equipment, either use the RIGB directly into the equipment, or you can use that pulse, which will account uh, for, for the same thing. Uh, instead of using the iRig, then here, what you will do is, okay, you will use binary input number one to act on a voltage pulse. That uh, would be the, the only difference. Um, here, I'm finished. Okay, um, sounds good. Um, well, this has been a really short webinar, so at this time the webinar is officially concluded, but based on feedback we got from our webinar series in the last year, we're mm -hmm. going to have an extended Q&A session for about another 30 minutes to make sure we got all the questions answered. Okay. If you have any questions right now, please submit them into the Q&A box. For those who you, of you that are leaving, when you close the webinar window, a survey box should pop up on screen. We will really appreciate it if you could take a couple of minutes to provide your feedback so that we can continue to improve future webinars. A copy of the presentation will be emailed to you in the next few days and a recording of this session will be available on our website at mega.com slash webinars in the next two weeks. This webinar landing page also contains the schedule for all upcoming webinars and the recordings of all previous webinars. So again, if you are looking for any information about mega webinars, the URL is mega.com slash webinars.